It's what well, good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining. Um, how can banks use AI to unlock new opportunities in payments? That's the theme of this webinar and the question that we'll aim to address over the next 45 minutes or so. My name's Kieran Hines. I'm a principal analyst at Celence, the technology research and advisory firm. I'm delighted to be joined by my two colleagues for today, two esteemed industry thinkers on all things relating to AI and payments. Uh, Tuan Van Bozikom, the strategy director at Icon Solutions, and Boris Bielek, the field CTO at MongoDB. Uh, so Boris, Tuan, uh, thank you for joining and being part of the conversation today. Thank you for having us. Absolutely, thank you. So we've got, a, it looks like a, a, wow, a surge of participants just joined, so let's get cracking. Um, but uh, before we get into the material, just a few words of uh, on housekeeping. Uh, so this is being recorded and uh, the recording will be available to you all at uh, some point after we wrap up today. I think it's coming out in the next couple of days. So uh, do look out for that. Uh, second point is that you will all be muted. Uh, so please don't shout out any questions because we won't hear you. Um, if you do have anything you'd like to, to put to any of us or any reflections on the, uh, the, the material and the discussion, uh, please use the Q&A box and we'll come to those a little bit later in the session. Uh, final point, if you do have any technical difficulties as we go along, uh, please use the uh, the chat in your control panel and the team will do its best to assist you. Uh, right, and so just before we really get in, a quick word about some of the uh, material that we'll be running through today. So uh, we'll be sharing a range of research findings around this theme of how banks can take advantage of artificial intelligence technologies to improve their revenues and margins relating to non-card payments. Um, a lot of these are going to be taken from a brand new Celent report, which is called Harnessing the Benefits of AI in Payments. And that's something that uh, MongoDB and Icon Solutions have very kindly sponsored. And as a result, a copy of this will be sent out to you all in the next couple of days. So do look out for that. A quick word about what's in there. Uh, so this pulls together three different strands of research, uh, which together give, I think, quite a rounded view on the opportunities for the industry in terms of uh, the applications and the potential use cases for AI around uh, payments. And so the first is a view on technology strategy across corporate banks, uh, which is taken from Celent's latest technology insight and strategy survey and that gives us a, a high level view across where some of these technologies sits within the broader basket of um, plans and investment priorities for the industry. Uh, the second is some detailed insights into the perspectives of corporate clients so end users around their operational pain points and uh, things around uh, their appetite for the kinds of value adding services that you can deliver through better use and management of transaction data. And the, the third strand of this is a very focused piece of research that looks closely at the views of people uh, working in uh, payment product teams and the technology functions of large banks in Europe and North America. And so together, if you put those things in one pile, then we have uh, in that report, so reflecting the views of around 570 uh, bank executives and end customers, which does give us a pretty comprehensive picture about where the market is and its thinking and where some of those opportunities are. And sorry to interrupt you already, Kieran, but I think we should point out this was really a violent re response from people from the interest side, way more than normally and very nicely globally distributed as well. So this is, in that regards, was actually, kudos to you, quite interesting to see. Thank you, Boris. And of course, um, so everyone will get a copy of this and say, so, yeah, please do enjoy. And if you have any questions, then uh, direct them to, to me or to uh, Boris or Tuan as well. I'm sure they'll be very happy to, to pick up the conversation. Right, so uh, let's get started. And I'd like to begin, it probably makes sense to start by level setting a bit about where we see the banking industry today in its uh, adoption of artificial intelligence technologies. And I've also included a definition here of what uh, we mean, certainly at Celence, when we talk about artificial intelligence. 
and that's there if you'd like to read it. Um, it seemed entirely appropriate to make use of the technology to do this, and the definition that you can see is one that's been mostly de derived even uh, from the internal LLM we have access uh, to here at Salent. Um, so there are two points I'd like to make. Uh, the first is that um, artificial intelligence um, is by no means new when we think about what's happening in banking. So the use of machine learning, uh, natural language processing and robotics and other technologies that you would bracket as part of that artificial intelligence umbrella are already widespread across a range of different areas and have been for a number of years. Um, in the case of areas like fraud, uh, risk and compliance, I think a lot of banks have been using AI technology since before some of these things were popularly considered to be AI. Um, the other point I think here is that investment in advanced analytics and AI technologies continues to deepen across the industry. And the chart you can see here shows some of the results from our latest technology insight and strategy survey, which shows that some advanced analytics um, and machine learning investments are a leading priority for 33% uh, of corporate banks, so the top priority uh, across the industry for this year. And that ranks higher than projects relating to robotics and automation, um, which are a focus for around 31%. Um, artificial intelligence and NLP are not far behind, and they were highlighted as a priority by 28% of banks. So key takeaway here is that this is an area that's seeing a huge amount of focus and investments now and for the coming year. Uh, the other point I think I want to flag is that this is supported uh, largely by the outcomes, and this drives the business cases in, in most instances. And you can see their call out number on the bottom left of the slide. So 73% of the corporate banks in our survey uh, reported that they had delivered clear revenue benefits from their investments in advanced data analytics. So uh, lots happening here and much of this grounded in uh, you know, successful investments. And so Boris, um, let's pick on you. Um, any thoughts or reflections around what we're seeing here and, and how does that map on to what you're seeing in the, in the marketplace? That what I mostly enjoy about this is when I saw it the first time, my initial reaction, hell no, this cannot be right, until I realized the actual physical investment of close to 30% into AI and natural, nat natural language processing is actually quite high. But we are still at the early stages there that people have not defined really all projects to the last piece out of that one. And when we see on the other side things, workflow automation, everybody talks about rack. Mm -hmm. uh, retrieval, augmented work, then when we take a look at this, I think the workflow automation part is, I think, the lowest hang hanging fruit right now. And specifically on the payment side, I have so many discussions where people say, yeah, we, we have a pretty good payment process, but for about 30% of the pieces, we do still a lot of manual labor and we have to interact and interfere because, and this is not 30% of transactions to be clear. This is one third of the transaction types they have because they're so exotic and, and so rare. And I believe the advanced data analytics and MLPs is really, it's fraud. It's fraud, KYC, everything related to this one on the payment side. I see this a lot, so I agree to this one, but I'm actually impressed by the 29% invest side into NLP and AI on top of obviously the workflow automation and the robot processing side. So, Toyn, what do you say? No, I, I, I agree, right? And it's an ex exciting part. And I, I do think it's early days. And one other thought I had uh, in this is that we've spent decades, you know, trying to automate to get the human error out. And now we're trying to have human thinking back in, right? So the one thing that you need to be really careful about in my mind is uh, uh, don't expect this to be, uh, you know, the trustworthy partner always if the if your data is bad. So that's the same with human learning, right? If you give them the wrong things to learn, then definitely you will get the wrong outcome. So one of the things is who do you trust in these cycles? Where do you go? And the, 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 the relation to a highly regulated environment for me is one of the key things to be mindful of. So uh, absolutely exciting. Absolutely, there are the business cases. Uh, the only thing is that uh, it depends on which part of the value chain you're at, whether these business cases make a lot of sense. As you say, Boris, right, on the very manual labor intensive uh, sites, like also the, 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 the front desk, right, where uh, people do the help desk. And 
those things are highly automatable because of available data sets. The more you go towards the regulated back end, you know, you have to really pick and choose your battles. Yeah. Yeah, that's some great points. Thank you. And I think that this theme of the fact that on the one hand, there are um, there's a growing appreciation of some of the opportunities, but also actually that this is not easy. You can't go out and buy yourself a briefcase full of AI. It's it's a complicated uh, process. And the themes we're going to come back to. <laughs> I love briefcase full of AI. Yeah. Can I get another kilo, please? So, yeah. Isn't that how it's sold? But by the weight, yeah. Uh, um, NVIDIA chips are still sold by piece, not by gram, sadly. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, 15k on eBay, uh, Boris. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, actually, and mentioning Nvidia is a nice segue into the, the next view, which and I think you can't really have a webinar today without referencing Gen AI. I think there's some kind of uh, uh, legal restriction around that. So, so let's make sure we we tick that <laughs> box. Um, and so I think while the excitement around generative AI is certainly understandable given the obvious potential I think that you can see to improve well certainly employee productivity uh, in, in most cases uh, the conversation has become a bit more nuanced through the latter part of last year and, and certainly the beginning of this year um, but I think the excitement and the the interest is understandable given uh, the potential but also I guess that noted realism um, is founded on some of the complexities of how you actually apply LLMs to you know potentially sensitive customer data, uh, as well as you know broader regulatory concerns, which apply quite heavily in banking, around you know the explainability and potentially the auditability of LLM outputs and these kind of things. Um, but but that said, I think we do see even today there are quite a number of areas in which Gen AI is already being used to support advisors and relationship managers in certain areas, and, and certainly we, we do expect to see further innovation. Uh, in these areas over uh, over the coming year or two. And this flows through in the research as well. Uh, so quite a complex chart, um, I'm afraid, but I'll unpack it quickly. Uh, and this shows the response to two questions from some of our recent primary research. On the y-axis of going up, that shows the proportion of banks that are currently exploring use cases or developing uh, proof of concepts or you know, similar activities around each of those technology areas. And then on the other, along the bottom, uh, that's the proportion that sees each of those technologies as having a major impact on the market in the next five years. Uh, and so uh, what you can see there are a range of different things, but we'll focus in on Gen AI. Uh, and one big takeaway here is that a lot of banks are actively exploring those use cases. About 58% of our sample said that, oh, 55% rather, uh, are doing this actively at the moment in some capacity. And there's a further 23% that have um, you know, projects using Gen AI in their, their roadmap. And so not no surprise there. Um, I think also interesting to note is that uh, Gen AI is seen as one of the technologies that will have the biggest impact on the industry in five years. And so I think across our research, we saw 36% of banks said that that's one of the things, one of the top three things they expect to be very significant over that kind of time frame. Whether or not there's a bit of hype mixed in there, uh, this is from sort of later on last year, this research. Well, we'll come to see, but nevertheless, I think points to a lot of interesting discussions to be had. Um, so, uh, Twan, perhaps I'll, I'll turn to you. Uh, any thoughts, reflections on this? Yeah, no, definitely. So, the, um, we also see, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the the opportunity of Gen AI, and uh, uh, we're also experimenting, obviously, at Icon uh, with it. And I'll get back to that one in a bit. The... The case that always for me starts with is to do what, right? So uh, I think that uh, most of these uh, uh, clients, we will look at the technology, we will look at how it works, we will look, look at the use cases, and they are, you know, goodly good, good publicized use cases. In essence, when you look at Gen AI, uh, the the whole prompting around that, there's one thing that we uh, that we struck as. Uh, uh, looking at your ecosystem around it, that for us, when we experimented, so we took a simple use case, right? We, we, we said, okay, let's get unstructured data and let's ask chat GTP to make it into structured data because uh, that is for ISO 2002 and the whole uh, migration towards that set one of the key areas that we need to look into. So we've got some mixed results. We've got some good results where, where, where they actually picked out the right, uh, uh, you know, uh, postcode for uh, uh, for the UK, uh, where, where we got into. 
But one of the things that you sell them here is we were a bit taken aback by the amount of compute power on AWS that you actually need to be able to run these types of uh, uh, questions and queries, right? So one of the things is uh, for us that really, if you're looking at these business cases, there is a cost factor there around cloud. And uh, what, uh, what Boris also said around, you know, uh, even if you're doing it yourself, uh, these chips, uh, uh, they, they, they will take a lot of money. So you have to really think about what are you prompting? What are you asking? Because uh, it's also well publicized now as to how much compute power every single question costs, right? So there's a lot you can still do with, you know, the 80, 90 things uh, percent that you uh, that you do as a bank and reserve this for the the absolute, you know, the new things that you want to do. So what, what's your thought uh, around that, Boris? Yeah, so I'm, I'm with you specifically on the cost factor, right? So it's very interesting to see different reactions from larger retail banks on global scale or even regional scale and some of the private banks who have ultra high net worth individual relationship manager problems. The interesting part, what we see right now is how rapidly the, what I call the private LLMs are evolving. So specifically companies like Mistral, Alab Alpha, both out of Europe, interesting enough. So obviously GDPR and things coming very heavily mm -hmm. into play here, but we see it as well in other regions in the world clearly, where people say we want to move actually faster, but we're not trusting the internet full stop. So like literally hitting the wall and the original things when everybody, I admit, including myself, experimented with open AI, chat GPT APIs, the Microsoft Azure interface, and then as well, Bedrock, Vortex, to name them all here, to be fair. So all the cloud providers I mentioned, it's important. But when I deal with the clients right now on the banking side, there's a very strong push, get the thing in-house. In-house yeah. can mean as well running on the public cloud, but it means in their control space, with all their compliance, regulatory connections or not. And that then loaded, overloaded with functions like SuperDuperDB, which is a smaller startup out of Berlin, which delivers the orchestration, the operational side to those mm -hmm. things. And then suddenly it becomes very fast, uh, actually something we can build upon with all the usual things when you talk payments, uh, you don't want to send your payments to the internet. I agree. So, that's very much when it starts. And and yeah. on the other side, if you have 5 billion payments already in your LLM, and then you do the experiment from Toyn in regards of, can you identify out of the handwritten note from the ultra high net worth individual sending a billion dollar to Boris, that's my dream to happen, it will not. <laughs> but yeah, and then analyzing this handwritten note, identifying what is a statement, so classical IOU, identify the banking records and generate an ISO record out of that. Um, that is actually something what we're working on with private banks who say, well, our clients expect that behavior back to toy. Money is no object at the cost for those clients. You don't need many billionaires to make some money with. No, absolutely. No, and, and, but it, it is interesting from a privacy indeed perspective that, uh, that, that you see this. You see it as a broader theme anyway. Um, but we were absolutely, like I said, absolutely taken aback by the by the just the spend on you know the IO that uh, that you would need. Uh, that's also one of the uh, the advices that we're taking. Some some of this you you have to do in house, and uh, you know you're going to have to buy your own uh, Nvidia chips and things like that. Uh, the factors are a hundredfold over normal processing of a payment, right? Uh, uh, in one of our experiments. Interesting. And I guess it proves a point that you know, generative AI, while it's very you know, topical at the moment, the same rules have to apply when it's about business cases and outcomes and product development. So interesting. Thank you. And so let's um, bring some of this a little bit to life by looking at a couple of use cases, um, not for generative AI specifically, but this broader theme of artificial intelligence. And in the reports, uh, we highlight a range of different ways in which uh, banks can potentially apply AI, and in some cases already are, um, AI and advanced analytics uh, to bring improvements to their front office services, uh, workflow and process improvements in the middle and back office, as well as some more sort of cross-functional or uh, horizontal activities. And so uh, 
here, um, we're going to focus a little bit on some of the potential front office opportunities. And to do so, uh, we're going to touch on some of the research that we did to capture the insights and preferences of corporate treasurers, so the end customer, um, or a, one of the end customers for a corporate bank. Uh, and through this, we're going to hopefully bring the voice of that um, end user, that customer, into the discussion. And so just taking a step back first, um, I think one of the questions that we wanted to pose an answer with this bit of the research was what is it that today's corporate treasurer needs or wants from their banking partners and i guess within that we're looking to really answer the question of what are corporate clients willing to pay for from their banking partners mm -hmm. uh, and at a high level i think the ask is almost always driven through the prism of um, how the corporate client can receive services from the bank that fundamentally help them to better manage the treasury function more efficiently and so that means that most of the things that tend to come through these sorts of questions cluster into one of three broad categories. One is around data access and visibility. Uh, then you have on top of that um, added value insights. And there's a range of different ways you can interpret that. But it's added value insights supported by transaction data and the um, analysis thereof. And then improvements to core services uh, such as payments and I think, you know, trade finance, credits also falls into that category as well. Um, now, what we see in the market, of course, is that the growth in the adoption of ISO 222 message formats provides a great opportunity for banks to invest in all of these areas uh, for lots of reasons. And, and there's a strong rationale for doing so shown on this slide here. And again, apologies, another uh, typical analyst consultant two by two matrix. Uh, what we're seeing is the, the output of a couple of views. Uh, and so, um, on the left-hand side going up, that's the perspective around relative willingness to pay uh, among corporate clients for a range of different uh, potential service enhancements. And then along the bottom, um, a different view, which is um, the proportion of corporate clients that would consider moving some or all of their, their business to a different provider to get access to those services. And what that gives us is a, a nice couple of perspectives. So in the top left, uh, in the green sort of shaded area, uh, you can see uh, several different use cases uh, around transaction data analytics and applying AI and things to, to that data uh, that can enhance corporate services in areas such as real-time get cash balances and visibility, uh, data analytics and tools to improve the um, usefulness of that data and so on. And so a couple of things to call out here. So... 77% uh, of corporate clients would pay for um, uh, real-time cash forecasts, and another 64% would pay, um, oh, sorry, 77% I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. would pay for uh, sort of insight-driven tools, and 64% would pay to access real-time cash forecasts. So some you know, strong potential uh, revenue uplift opportunities for banks are investing in those areas. On the flip side, uh, bottom right, we see that uh, just over 20% of corporates would consider moving their business to access uh, automated tracking and reconciliation of receivables or significant improvements in those services. And I guess what that gives us is, is a picture when we think about some of the business cases for these investments is that it's too uh, two sided. On the one hand, there are revenue opportunities, but there is also a necessity to think about these things purely to protect your existing business. And so, Boris, I know you're very keen on this. What's your what are your takeaways from this view? So I can get into an one hour <laughs> right now. Hold me back. But basically, I mostly find it amazing that indeed we talk all about the upper left side, which is all these value add services where people are willing to pay for. And yeah, one of the biggest discussion we have with large clients is still I need to get global view and I would like to get a global view on my cash positions. It's probably one of the hottest subjects what people have including FX challenges and, 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 and this is probably not only the fortune 1000, but when we look still today on a global scale, there's a lot of companies which have issues more than one country, more than one currency and more than one bank, maybe at that point, but I love the red zone mm -hmm. because red zone is a dirty one. These are the things when we talk to clients and interesting enough to banks as well, this automation of payables should be a no brainer. So we talked with a client about automatically corrections. 
repeat errors which happen through typical scenario an old lady put up a twisty into an account number for an insurance payment and that same thing breaks every month again and again and again because nobody dares to correct it and it could be auto corrected after three times things like that and processes which do this automatically on large scale uh, when I hear people having in some of these things between one and three percent still failure rates, I was shocked, shocked. And this is just user errors. Mm -hmm. And I was just a mm -hmm. victim of that by paying off my credit card bills. So I don't want to get into details, but that should be something which should have been automatically detected. And things like virtual accounts. Yeah, these are all you would say, well, this is go for part today, but it's not specific when you think supplier relationships onboarding new accounts sounds so simple but even getting somebody a payer pay relationship over one country border by now operated with all compliance factors is a huge effort and there's always something missing and oh, another document is sent out and need another week and there are physical people handling that one so the question is clearly can gen ai and ai help on those things and remove that risk of churn. And then obviously, when I see the ISO 2022 compliance, that one, Ton and I, yeah, Ton is laughing already. But this is this is so painful by now to start seeing. And it is so happening so often in so many small things that, yeah, I would see a lot of happy things happening on that side. On the left side, the green stuff, this is what I expect. But decision-making support for clients based on banking data is probably one of the things for the last five years and will get bigger and bigger and bigger. People expect more than just moving money by the bank. I think that's a fair point. Toyn? Yeah, absolutely. But the uh, having said that, Boris, the, they still expect the bank to do the basics well. And what you said, this is, some, this is not something that is new. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I want my references back. I want my data back. I want it in the standard form. Is the stuff that large corporates have been saying for 30 years, right? So uh, whether immediately AI will help in that area, it, this for me is just good housekeeping in the end, right? It, it will be, you know, how, how do you manage, you know, getting your data in a single place? How do you manage getting it into a, a, an understandable form? And actually most corporates say, just give me a form. And now we've standardized on 2002. But, uh, and, but it, for me, the key thing is to get it in real time, to give it to me, et cetera, right? So, for me, on those sides, I don't see the large cases of AI around that. This is really something that banks can do without AI, and they should be able to do that very, very well. And that is what they risk, is indeed, the, they expect not to pay for it, these clients, right? So that's the key point here. They will walk away. So a bank that can do this well, and obviously the newer banks have a bit of an advantage here, because they don't have, you know, 27 engines and, and, and all of the legacy, but they will walk there. So on the on the left and on the green side is indeed so it of course you can use Gen AI for, for real-time cash forecasting, right? But it has to be a really good case because our the, your corporates are very well versed in this area. Right, they have been also doing this, uh, 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 you know, because of the deficits of many banks that actually struggle to give that overall view and to give that that that, that data. So, if you then add the cost to that uh, uh, and open up a, uh, uh, a prompting natural language as to, dear uh, dear bank, what will my uh, what will my cash balance be? Uh, you know, twenty uh, uh, sixth of June most likely. Uh, how much are they actually willing to pay for that specific question? And what does that question cost you? I think that you have to figure that one out uh, before you uh, uh, before you actually make all of the investments here. Agreed, but I would challenge you on this one. Go because for it. When, when we look at these, when we bring these cash balance discussion together with this automatic tracking and reconciliation of receivables, yeah. which is more the centerpiece, which is a typical question, uh, how much do I pay Billy Joe Incorporated in that space uh -huh. in the next two months? What is my expected roughly pay flow, cash flow globally with my supplier XYZ Sync Automotive, right? Factories yeah. or rather. So at that point, I think there is a lot of things which I think is a little bit sad because it it is kind of in a neutral zone in the middle. It's not generating new revenues. It's not really churn. But I have the gut feeling these are things 
which are kind of like submarines a little bit. People get really rather more angry on that stuff more and more time and time. That And that's, again, where the Gen AI part comes in. So we are working with several banks where we in, ingest more uh, bill mm -hmm. of materials, invoices, uh, things like that. And the system actually is able to match exactly this one where you say, okay, look, I have the following payment. I match it now to the following invoice. Yeah. Actually, it was because the invoice number was missing on the payment. So yeah. that's a typical problem. So those kind of things, I think people are willing to maybe not pay for it, but they will put a value onto on top of that one. Oh, well, yes, no, I, and that's where I agree, Boris. The, the thing is that um, for a bank to step into this area, I, I agree that this is, you know, all around that breaking up of a value chain and this is a order management space. And, you know, this is a, a together with risk advice around all of that, because I think that that's always something that's underlighted as to what you can charge for. Uh, you're, but you are stepping in the space where, you know, the ERP vendors are, where you have cash and liquidity management providers that they are. So uh, it is a unnatural place for banks to start to compete in a large because you are multi-bank most, most of those times, right? So is there an opportunity there? Yes. Uh, do you need a very, very structured view around revenue and cost? Yes. Fantastic. I think that just my own perspective is that I think this piece around hygiene factors, there is stuff that you just need to invest in to continue to serve your existing clients well, I think is a yeah, one of the big takeaways. Um, fantastic. So, but I still would ask you, Kieran, so where do you see this great automation of payables? Obviously, that's risk of churn kind of like borderline, 20% is not like 40, but that's still one-fifth of my clients are really upset about that subject. Yep. Yeah, well, it's a great point. And I think the, the interesting thing there is that that's you're looking there at the market average, but it does fluctuate depending on where you ask that question, the, the business, uh, the, the industry, or the, the kind of business that is facing those challenges. If you're a business that you know, uh, sees that as a particular problem, then if you're one of the banks serving that client, then you really need to get your acts together. Uh, and I think what this shows is that there are I think it just reinforces that point that um any bank um operating in a space and servicing corporate clients needs to be really aware of the need to deliver on some of these areas um in order to you know continue to maintain the business that they have and this is partly and the other thing I think is really interesting around this corporate treasurer research is that we always try and remind people that corporate treasurers are people too and the experience that you have um in your you know in consumer banking and consumer payments i think is something that over time you begin to expect in your, your professional life as well and so um you know accepting that uh, most of these transactions are far more complicated and uh, difficult to deliver than say a card payments to amazon um i think nevertheless you do okay. see the shift in the expectation level from corporate clients as being influenced by what's happening in the retail space and in you know um online commerce and other areas and i think again it kind of increases the importance for corporate banks of thinking about you know again going back to all of their looking at their workflows and uh processes from a customer point of view and say well where are the pinch points where can we improve and you know what will that do to help us you know smooth negotiations about renewals and even potentially win new customer business flows in the future Fantastic. Well, let's move on um, to the second use case to explore, um, which is around the opportunities to use generative AI uh, in quite a specific way, thinking about an idea of developer efficiency. And this might sound a bit like we're jumping on the Gen AI bandwagon, but I think one of the biggest challenges that a lot of banks face today is around the constraints of developer resources or developer capacity uh, that limits their ability to deliver product enhancements and innovation in the way that they'd like to. And this was something that we, we did research and across Europe and North America, 45% uh, of tier one banks said this was a real problem for them. Uh, it came out as the biggest challenge to product innovation in payments. And this is something which is also made worse or um, made more acute by the need to prioritize compliance related uh, changes and other projects as well. Uh, now. I guess this sounds a little bit abstract, but there is an opportunity cost 
to this. And we attempted to measure this in the research and we found that on average, a tier one bank um, was telling us that they were missing out on between three and four pretty substantial payment product enhancements over the past two years, purely because of resource constraints in their technology function. So you know, about two per year on average. Uh, now, obviously, again, slightly abstract, so it's important to try and convert this into uh, to, to, to dollars if we can. We tried to do this in the research and by asking those banks what they felt that the missed revenue growth opportunity was from not delivering those enhancements. And on average, uh, the industry feels that uh, around 5%, 5 5.3% uh, revenue growth was lost purely because of developer resource constraints. And that I think tries to highlight the opportunity cost there. So while that 5% figure might be a little bit punchy, it's certainly not zero. I think this makes it a very important topic to, to consider. And so when we think about generative AI and the role that it can play, I think there are uh, lots of different ways that you can use this technology in that development workflow. It's not just code generation, it's about things like you know, supporting documentation, capturing user feedback and, and so on. And this, is, this does seem to be an area that more and more banks are giving uh, very serious consideration to you, largely to help address some of those uh, pain points that they, they see in the market. Um, and, and Twana, I know this is a subject that's quite dear to your heart. Um, what are your perspectives on, on this and where do you see the opportunities for generative AI? No, uh, definitely right. So the, what we uh, what we see also uh, um, in uh, when we helping customers to basically go faster with their development because we do see a uh, the pendulum shifting back to clients want to have to control themselves, right? So they they uh, they don't want to buy a black box from somebody. They don't want to. Uh, they they want to know exactly what they're getting. They want to know exactly how they can manage it. They want to know exactly how they can upgrade it. How they can tune it. How they can manage it. The smaller the banks, obviously, that goes to another side of the spectrum. But the big banks that we work with, they need control. So, Gen AI can also still definitely help there. But the point is that you need to be able to look at the code before you compile, before you put it in there, because banks need to know what they're putting in, right? And how they can change it and how, to, how they can manage it. So the generation of code is absolutely key, but it is about the code. So it can be, it can go a lot faster. And indeed, so what we, uh, what we do is we, like we said, we also uh, experiment and we, uh, uh, you know, the whole low, no code approach that we, uh, that we have is, uh, is there. It is also good to see that uh, you know the the one that uh, that struck my eye to go back to that difficult to build the business case right it is very very hard for people to look at you know how much is this going to take how long is it going to take how much is it going to cost me and what is my revenue about it and i think that we will have more and more data points and we're also uh where we see a very good opportunity is to quickly test stuff out right so does this work do I need to, can I get a good clean piece of code that I can put in and I can manage in my wider ecosystem? Because also there is, the code is absolutely key to get you forward. We also have to be mindful of obviously, and this, this is my little set way in the end to, uh, you know, the data is key for this part, right? So to go into Boris, but the whole thing around uh, uh, you know, development, your CICD pipeline, how do you connect it into your overall ecosystem? How does this actually work? That is not a insignificant part of the cost that is the most part, part of the cost for most banks, right? So the code is really important. You need to get it, but you need to look at the entire chain from a development perspective, from a data perspective to be able to make these cases. And you need great data for that, don't you, Boris? Yeah, it's always me. So <laughs> I I see it from a different side. I find this 5% actually quite substantial. So, and when I look, I find it really in a certain way funny, which is it's not. The part between the IT budget constraints with the short of, of developer capabilities, obviously there's a correlation somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I find it interesting that the IT budget constraint is so much smaller than the shortage of the developer constraint resources. But when I look at it, we have the experience now we introduce things like uh, natural language support for creating um, 
new aggregations in, in the aggregation framework. So what you could use to utilize for KYC or fraud detection, stuff like that. And there's a lot of things happening. I'm mostly, honestly, really hot right now, as you pointed out as well, on testing. People want to test code. People want to understand the tests, want to do a different approach, generate test cases out of business requirements is a big thing. What we see, we're working with a bank in Australia right now on that one. And one of the hottest items was that we literally run the old web app and took the web app interfaces and fed them into, uh, yeah, into an LLM and then let this one generate as automatically the new test cases for the new application. So things like that are pretty cool, but the developer cap uh, capacity, this will go actually further, I think, when we take a look how more millions of apps are written again and again, and mm -hmm. the number of apps and requirements is growing faster than the number of people who can code it. Yeah, I think there will be a drive more to generating more code, but probably not generating just with tools of uh, the co-pilots which start out of, but there will be much more where you describe actually business problem and then generate code out of that one, which is back to Toyn's point, probably something where somebody needs to look at to begin with. It's not all perfect coming out, but it saves you 80% of the time on the version one. You can start out with this one and move on. D2 as well for code conversion, we introduced the product code, and this is a plug now, sorry about that one. Relational migrator, normally we don't do that, but where we actually convert existing relational infrastructure automatically uh, through very smart methods over into a document model, which is then helping for a lot of people getting legacy data out of payment, legacy payment platforms into an ISO format then as well, and so on. So that stuff happens a lot, but yeah, the documentation part, testing, I think this is my big peeve on that list. And that leads as well to this lack of subject matter experts within the bank, which is kind of middle of the road. But when we take a look at it, this is really driving in both directions. On one side, the people need to translate information to the developers and then have on the other side, the business requirements, the security from the CISO office, compliance, regulatory, on the other side. So I find this quite interesting how this picture is building out. Now I, I, I very much you know, agree on it. The, the, the lack of uh, business knowledge is, uh, is a key one. And where, uh, where you wanna go with one end is, okay, how do, I, how do I manage it? How do I maintain that? But also in a, in a AI type of environment, if you can get the mundane stuff done, I fully disagree, right? So if we know, we know what a SEPA payment needs to look like and things like that, right? So if that can be documented and that, that that's what also what we are looking at, you know, that will speed up these things and that will also help your clients to do what they do. Because in essence, these banks find it very difficult and normally to, to is this a change in my business model or is this mostly a thing that will, I would need to do the same thing, but more, more efficiently in the end. And I need to do it with less risk. Brilliant points, brilliant points. And I think it also speaks to the, uh, on the human aspect of this, you know, a different way of thinking about how you staff some of these functions, but it certainly requires a greater knowledge of the business process to, uh, supports a lot of those changes and then using um, Gen AI and similar tools in, in, in the right way, I suppose. Um, right, just conscious of time. So we have uh, one, let's move on to the final thoughts. And so um, I think there are three conclusions that I want to highlight from the research. I think when we think about the opportunities for artificial intelligence and payments, the, Big takeaway, the first one is that there's no silver bullets and there's no single thing you can do that will move the needle on its own. And so when we think about the potential and what this conversation has all been uh, wrapping around is that the aim or the way to think about this for a bank is to consider how you invest in the capabilities to support enhancements across a whole range of different areas and, and vectors. So there's, there isn't just one thing you can do that will make a difference. This is about changing the the mindset, if you like, of the organization when it comes to thinking about data and how you can apply AI technologies and analytics to unlocking gains 
in some cases, you know, what might look like small incremental gains, but gains across a whole range of different workflows will add up to make a big difference for any organization. A uh, link to this uh, is the view that any bank embarking on this journey needs to invest in the right foundations to do so. Uh, so, you know, doing anything well with data is difficult um, and requires not just an investment in technology and a shift in um, the the organizational culture, if you like, or the approach to the way that data is handled, managed, and, and so on within the organization. I think in the case of payments, you know, often when we think about how you unlock some of these opportunities, the key is also to do so in parallel with um, wider payment modernization initiatives and, and projects too. And final thought for me, I think, is that uh, when thinking about the question, well, where, where do I start? It becomes an issue around prioritization or really just, just get started somewhere. Uh, each bank will have its own uh, opportunities depending on its clients, its uh, internal uh, technology stack and, and pro propositions and, and so on. Um, but this really is a case of um, working through your own uh, priorities and, and challenges and thinking about how you can begin to unlock some of the potential opportunities that we've highlighted today. Uh, Boris, I know you've got lots of things to share on, particularly mm -hmm. at middle points, but uh, any, any final thoughts from you? Yeah, so I, I may jump directly to a question because in, in the sense of time, mm -hmm. there was a gentleman asking a question about what about data privacy in this whole picture, which we completely skirted around. And I would like to go back to my earlier comments about private LLMs. This is exactly the reason why people move to private systems. And you cannot load uh, customer information up on the internet over chat GPT or stuff like that. When I hear things like that, I get normally very, very nervous. Um, so private LLMs. And the second part is again, P part for me, you can say it's a product plug, but not meant as such is good data and good data preparation is solving 90%. This is basically why honestly with MongoDB, we are so successful in this space because it brings the data better together it's not just having ISO data sets, but enriched data sets, utilizing those ones in an internal setting with vector search. And so I can invite everybody to check out our vector search capabilities, but do this inside the database already before you even get into models, into external modeling. And the second part is my experience is honestly, a lot of the public models are quite well fitting for payments and payment requirements. So I normally tell people, before you start investing five person years in identifying a model and building your own, see what's available, check them out, and you can run in MongoDB even three, four, five models in parallel and generate five vectors, and then do A-B testing, which one is the best result before you go live on something. So be very practical, be very basic. It's a lot of plumbing and, and plugging what's happening here. But this is well where environments like SuperDuperDB come into play, where you want to look into how can I can rapid things going. So we implemented some solutions in two days at a client. And this is not marketing. This is just to get running. I'm not saying it was a perfect solution, but to get running, to get the thought process from, in theory, we should to something practical. So this decide where to get started do a lot of things, fail fast, and then you realize where you get for your institution, the bank for the buck. And by doing it internally, you will end up always immediately with the security, what you need, but not going up on the internet. Well, a great question, Ed. Thank you, Boris. So, uh, Twan, just to turn to you, I, was, another question that's come through um, is around how seriously do you think banks are looking at these opportunities i mean it's, it's all fine and dandy for us to sit here and talk about it but i mean what, what's happening in your view in terms of uh, your, your own clients uh, what, what we see is you know uh, it, it it really depends on uh, where you are to bank uh, at which part of the value chain and where you're managing it right so i think it's uh, what boris said the experimentation is you know you need to do that but you can only do it at the front end part of your, you know, where, where you're not really breaking things and where you are not, you, you, you can't just, you know, say, uh, make your best efforts to send this payment to somebody, right? Um, it is about, uh, you know, this is the, what is it, the highest regulated uh, uh, industry after nuclear, right? So the, 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 
what we see is that yes, we are experimenting and we are all, all for that, but it needs to be part of a wider strategy where you say, okay, this is the experimentation phase and this is what I want to get out of it, right? So what we also say, what we always say is that you have to be able to answer three questions. Why do I need to do this? Right? Do I want to make less money, spend less, uh, make more money, spend less money, or not go to jail? Right? Normally is the is the thing. Uh, the the other one is what does good look like, and how do I get there? Right? So in that sense, uh, if you look at those three questions, uh, I think that you need to be able to answer those. And if you want to get out of the experimentation phase into an industrialized phase. That is where the, uh, you know, it, it needs to be part of that wider strategy, your payment strategy, your data strategy, and what are you want to achieve. And that's also where we go back into those business cases. Uh, you need a proper view on what is this, how long will it take, what's going to cost me, and what is it going to make for me. And I think that banks are getting towards those, uh, uh, th those answers, but uh, we're not quite there yet. Yeah. And to be honest, when we take a look to some of the new payment regulations coming up and all the things happen around this one, this whole real-time angle, we, we didn't have the time to get into that one, but this whole real-time decision-making at, at speed in milliseconds will become a challenge for a lot of corporate clients. And it will be something where banks, smaller banks specifically, I think will struggle with. And the answer is, oh, this is not my problem. I have a payment provider in the middle will not be good enough anymore. So I think there will be a lot of things happening in that space as well. And uh, to the audience, if you guys would like to have follow-ups, uh, you get the invites and the names. Obviously, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and answer any questions when they're coming up. So, and if anyone does have any questions, please do send them through. We've still got a couple of minutes. And so just uh, another one that has come in. So this looks like one more for you, perhaps, Boris. <laughs> Uh, where does where do you see banking compared to other uh, business areas or industries? I guess when it comes to AI, you only have a slightly broader view, don't you? Across, um, I would say they're pretty good at the front from the experimentation side. The most aggressive ones I see right now is actually interesting enough in engineering, manufacturing, and in pharma. No big secret on that one. They try to optimize in both cases engineering investments. Imagine you built somewhere on the west coast of the US an electrical car engine, and now you have a requirement coming out of Japan. And instead of building another engine from scratch, you can identify that you actually built an engine already for the same purpose with the same functionality. You built one great uh, product uh, called something, and then you sell the same product for losing weight. So you guys can all figure out what I'm talking about. So that's in pharma happening. Those two are are pretty much at the spearhead of those environments to identify reusage of, of existing assets, obviously, which is slightly different than the banking approach. I see in the banks, really the reducing cost while enhancing services is really the hotspot where I see the world going right now. And in that regards, I see bank right now in, in the third position, so to speak. I don't know if this is fair or not. This is a very subjective statement. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And I guess it's just uh, we've got time for one last quick one. So uh, perhaps one of you both, but maybe Twan uh, yeah. first. Um, where do you see, or do you see any pockets of innovation uh, at region or country level? So are there any, uh, I guess, the spirit there? Is there any sort of trends or themes, particular markets or parts of the world racing ahead? Well, it, it, it is uh, more in a, uh, there is always a, uh, what we see is, Three regions majorly, right? In payments, uh, that is the, uh, the the US, the Eurozone, and Asia. And if you see what's have been happening in uh, in Asia, the the willingness to experiment there is always a bit higher than it is in Europe or in uh, in the US because uh, they they have been able to leapfrog a lot a, a large part of the legacy that uh, that the US and uh, the EU has and the banks are on average they are newer so it's easier for them to start to implement these types of uh, uh, innovations and sometimes uh, uh, the, the regulation is also a bit more lenient towards that than uh, uh, than we are in uh, in Europe where we are highly highly regulated in that sense so uh, I fully agree with Boris that uh, where we go into uh, into Europe especially uh, 
a lot of it will be in-house. And also from a privacy perspective, you can't just send PI right out, out in that sense. Um, the US is somewhere in, in, in the middle. Uh, they, they obviously have the whole uh, mentality sometimes that uh, I'll just hire a bunch of engineers from Silicon Valley and then uh, they will upgrade my entire bank. Uh, and then, you know, it, it, it turns out to be really difficult. Uh, uh, so th there's a lot of, uh, because AI, like you said in your, your comment, uh, uh, Kieran, it is not a, it's not a silver bullet in the end, right? So uh, if, if you need to do the basics and you need to clean it up, um, and I think that that is uh, where the U.S. is at a uh, uh, at a point where they start to realize, okay, I need to carve up my ecosystem to be able to support these types of things. I just well, we have had one Nothing more question from my side, so I'm I'm pretty good. Oh, well, sorry, gentlemen, we have one more question come through. If we can perhaps cover this in just very briefly. Uh, what are the business challenges for implementing virtual accounts? Is that most regulated, most regulatory, or compliance? Any, any thoughts? Um, I'm trying to find an angle with virtual accounts to be honest, and uh, an AI uh, in that sense. You know, virtual accounts in my mind are a very uh, a well established uh, uh, thing, and it's also in the the report. I think that 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 we, that we announced it. it. It is not even something that most corporates are willing to pay for anymore, right? Where you do see a market in my mind to just put it a bit wider is what Boris also announced it. So if you as a bank are able to say, these are my payments, these are my invoices, this is how it all rolls together. This is how I roll it up between my dollar units, between my high level accounts. That part is really valuable, especially if you're also then looking at, you know, how can I add in value-added services around aggregation, around netting, around uh, uh, effects that, that you have to have in those areas. So uh, I don't know whether it exactly answers the question that, uh, that was asked, but uh, uh, I think it's more in that area that where banks have to look. Yeah, and uh, virtual accounts in the basics, it's a given. More interesting is when you go into things like pay as you go relationships with clients where one client has four or five purchases at one supplier, one, you have the middleman in the middle, you try to manage those kind of things. There's a lot of stuff happening there where I think AI can help to bring things together. But the, the biggest thing is to drive more value out of the concept of virtual accounts is I think the interesting part. And that leads to all this cash discussions, what we had yeah. earlier. So it's 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 not black and white, I think, to say there's something. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you both. Well, that is all we have time for, I'm afraid. So apologies uh, if we couldn't get to your question. Um, but so thank you to Twan and Boris for sharing your insights today. And thank you all for, for joining us and sharing your time. Um, Thanks, Sierra. Thank you, guys. The, the recording will be made available later. And of course, the report's copy is coming out as well. And uh, we are all open, open to continuing the conversation if you'd like to. So thank you again and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Okay.